Okay, everybody, settle down, settle down. Let's get started. I'm really looking to get the team's input on these important issues. First item on today's agenda, Al. Those market share figures are coming in lower than forecasted for this quarter. We need to get out there. Hit the pavement running. Keep our eye on the ball. Are you with me? Uh, Jeff, what's going on here? Oh, hi, honey. Just a daily huddle with me and the team. Um, you're sitting at the dining room table with the dog. And he's wearing a sweater. Hey, don't dismiss what Al Puccino has to say. Isn't that right, buddy? <laughs> Social health in the workplace. It's what we're talking about today. This is the Insights at Work podcast. Is that a bird over there? Did you get a parrot? Who, Polly? She's in communications. <laughs> what? Let's dive in. I'm Jeff Livingston, and this is Insights at Work, the HR podcast that looks at what's happening in the HR world, takes your questions, and studies the research to help HR experts move forward. It's prepared by HR experts for HR experts. In today's episode, we're chatting with Pete Bombacci. There's definitely been something missing over the last two years in the workplace. Now, if I could just put my finger on it. (laughs) Yeah, people. Well, fortunately, things are changing. And we're getting back to in-person working. And that's why today's guest's insights are so relevant. Pete is the founder of the Genwell Project. Pete, welcome to the Insights at Work podcast. Jeff, absolutely great to be here. And I wonder what that thing is that we've been missing for the last two years. It is people. So like so many of our listeners, I've been sequestered away in the home office since the beginning of the pandemic. So my social skills are a bit rusty. Now, I've been really looking forward to this episode because for the past two years, we've been increasing our focus and the importance we place on mental health inside and outside of the workplace. But the importance of social health is rarely talked about. So let's kick things off with getting a better handle around the difference between mental health and social health. Yeah, it's a great uh, it's a great question, Jeff. And our definition of social health is that it, it's the ability to form satisfying interpersonal relationships with other people. Now, when we think of what we've lost over the course of the last two years, it has been many of those connections that we had throughout the course of the day. And if you look at some of the research, which says that 63% of the people we saw every day were not in our calendars, all those casual collisions, almost two-thirds of the people you saw every day in the course of your life Uh, pre-pandemic were people that you didn't uh, plan on seeing, whether that was in the office at the water cooler, the coffee machine on the street, in your community, all those connections added up to us feeling more connected. So social health is really focused on building greater uh, human connection in all of those places because we need to start thinking about our employees not only as employees but actually as the holistic human being that they are and that they bring to work each and every day. In regards to you know social health versus mental health, mental health is really in many cases a symptom to the underlying root cause. So our focus is really on what is the action that we want to get people to take which is building stronger human connection in the workplace and how can we avoid the mental health issues that occur when we don't have those healthy social connection habits, whether it's in at the workplace or at home. Now, Pete, a lot of companies, they've always had that social committee and even long before the pandemic. How does social health go beyond what the social committee is responsible for? Was a focus on social health just as important before the pandemic? And why do you think it's so important that companies have a handle on social health coming out of this pandemic? Yeah, it's so interesting, Jeff. You know, really, there's always been the social committee, but, you know, as uh, and as somebody who led a few social committees, committees in his lifetime, and, and we've all been there, we've, we've, we've blown off the people who've, uh, who've been a lead of those committees in often cases. It's, oh, not another one of those activities, not another one of those events. And I think that really, uh, really uh, indicates how we haven't really understood how important social health is for our well-being. You know, most of us have been educated in our lives to exercise. We've had a program called Participation since 1971. We've had the Canadian Food Guide since 1942. So all of us know we've been trained, we've been educated to think about physical health and its importance to our well-being. 
how eating well is important to our uh, important to our well-being and unfortunately we've never been educated on the importance of social connection for our well-being and this is what we're really trying to bring forward so those social community activities are important but as one of our clients who we're working with in the workplace right now said you know we did all these things but number one nobody knew why we did them and number two there was never a strategy behind it it was understanding that it's not just about connecting i know a lot of people and i spent many years in the beverage alcohol industry thirsty thursdays were a uh, you know a great opportunity for us to get connected well yes they are but they don't they're not inclusive you know there's people who don't drink for various reasons there's cultural differences you know friday or thursday at four o'clock for people that have kids may not be the ideal time to bring people together so when we think about how we build those opportunities for people to connect in the workplace we have to be more conscious and intentional that really what we're trying to do is do what's right for everybody be more inclusive build a program and build a series of activities that allow people to get connected proactively so let's not continue to wait till people are sick before we try to take action but let's also think of the various types of people and individuals that are within our organization and how can we how can we build a series of activities that make everybody feel like they're part of it make everybody feel like the office actually cares the workplace cares about them as a human being and not just as an employee yeah now i'm a big fan of hal johnson and joanne mcleod i grew up with them <laughs> every afternoon and on the weekend. So I know exactly what you're talking about. So Pete, I think that focusing on social health in the workplace, it's more than just a nice to have. And that's something that you mentioned. Our research at ADP, it shows that candidates and employees, when they're looking for a new role or evaluating a current role, they want to see that alignment. They want to see that connection with their values and the values of their employer. So how does improving social health help to create a more inclusive and supportive workplace? And, and what are some of the other benefits of social health in the workplace? Well, hey, the, the opportunity to uh, bring people together is good for both parties. And I think that's the real power. And even coming out of the great resignation, we know that, you know, three of the big reasons why people were leaving their organizations was that my boss doesn't care, my company doesn't care, and I don't feel included, or I don't feel a sense of belonging here. And I think all of those things really point to the fact that most of us weren't connected in our workplaces, whether it's to our bosses and our leaders, or whether it's to our colleagues who we need to, to, to connect with in order to get the job done. You know, from a business standpoint, you know, when we build stronger connections in the workplace, we see increases in productivity, increases of collaboration, trust, loyalty. Uh, we see um, a reduced turnover. We see less mistakes. The average disengaged employee makes 60% more mistakes than, than the engaged employee. So that's the business side of it, Jeff. But I actually think maybe a bigger part of this might be about what it does for the employees. You know, disconnected employees have uh, greater health issues. They're, they're unhappy. They, you know, uh, disconnected human beings have greater risk of type 2 diabetes, early onset dementia. So when we talk about building a healthy and happy and connected workplace, we're doing it because it's what's right for the business, but it's also because it's what's right for the employees themselves. And you know what, when I think about the relationships that I've built in the workplace, and it was so much easier when we were doing it in person. And things that I always think about is, I feel more accountable when we're working together, but I also feel that I can be more authentic and I can be more transparent when an issue comes up and we're trying to work something out. Well, hey, let's just look at these Zoom meetings that we've been on when we've been trying to brainstorm. And not all technology is bad, and there's certainly been some amazing technology and platforms that have come out uh, before the pandemic and even uh, within the pandemic. But when we're trying to brainstorm, and I know I'm one of those people who likes to jump in with a new, hey, Jeff, I want to build on that. I got something out trying to do that on a Zoom is really challenging. And so, you know, we know that 70% of communication happens through body language and tone and other things. When you are in a room, and I've done it a few times over the last few weeks where I've gotten together with people to discuss something, it is so refreshing and so exciting to be back in the same room with people, brainstorming, ideating, and coming up with new ways and new approaches to do, frankly, anything in society uh, in our lives. Because I think we have so disconnected from one another over the course of the last two years. And Zoom 
even though the research shows that in some cases, the opportunity to be on a digital platform can be as close to human connection as possible. But even those little uh, those little gaps between reality and, and the digital platform over time make us realize that we do feel less connected to you as an individual and frankly, holistically as a human being, it's part of society. You know, we recently just had a podcast with Ken Hughes and Ken Hughes is a behavioralist from Ireland. He really one of EU's top disruption experts and he's an expert on creating creativity and inspiration in the workplace. Ken talked about, he's like, you know, we've been languishing We've been in this innovation sludge the last two years because we don't have this stimulus, this external stimulus that's happening. We're not going to different places every day. We're not meeting different people every day. We're not having different conversations in different places that really are encouraging that creativity and giving us new ideas and helping us inspire uh, innovation and new things in the workplace and maybe new ways to get things done. Yeah, I think that stat that, you know, if 63% of the people that we communicated and connected with every day uh, were wiped out of our lives at the start of the pandemic. And let's remember that social isolation, disconnection and loneliness were a part of the workplace long before the global pandemic. What the pandemic was just shone a light on it. And, and with almost two thirds of our connections every every day not being in our calendar, it wasn't something that we were conscious of it just was because, as, as Ken was saying, we were out and about. We were having all these incredible interactions, whether it was old friends, old colleagues, somebody from a different department. And now that those things were wiped out of our lives, I think we're becoming uh, more aware. I, I, I still, Jeff, get a lot of people who say, Pete, I really miss the office. And I say, are you sure you miss the office? Because I don't think people tend to miss chairs and desks and walls and lampshades. What they miss is people. So in the workplace, who's responsible for developing that strategy? Who's responsible for pushing that uh, social health agenda forward? The new position called the chief connection officer, Jeff. <laughs> no, actually, you know, I think traditionally, I think we might assume that it's the HR department. But I also might assume that it starts from the top. And it's just when we talk about culture. Uh, we talk about the way we do things in a workplace. It starts from the top and how the senior leaders communicate and engage with the employees throughout the organization. So unfortunately, as I think, uh, I think we've all uh, realized over the last decade or two, you know, vision and values on the wall are really wonderful, but really it's about demonstrating those things. And I think when it comes to human interaction, I think it certainly starts from the top, but HR plays a role. Pete, what are the steps that the HR professional needs to consider when building that strategy? What are the first programs that they maybe could look to enhance in the workplace? Well, I think we create a proactive schedule activities that connect. So first off, connect people. So let's put it in the calendar. If we believe wholeheartedly, as the research shows us, that there's so many benefits for the business and for the employee, then let's proactively put it in the calendar and let's make sure that we're giving every employee in the organization to be part of building those stronger connections. And let's not always do it just to force people to connect. I think random coffee days and random lunches are awesome. I think Thirsty Thursdays are awesome. I think introducing people to more purpose, so taking them out and getting your hands dirty at a daily bread food bank or at a Habitat build. There's so many ways in which we can bring our organized to, organizations together by connecting people to things that matter to them as human beings, not as employees. Not every training session should be about doing your work better. It should be about being better human beings. And if we build that holistically in a proactive way and through a positive lens, not in a reaction to a crisis, Jeff, I believe that that is the magic that we can create in organizations that will drive greater success. Now, one of the activities that has been my favorite social activity at ADP is that a team of us will go out and we'll volunteer at a local food bank. And we were connected to that food bank because one of our colleagues volunteers there every weekend. When we were talking before the podcast, we were talking about a program that your organization puts together. And it's just a cornerstone, I think, of delivering that social health strategy. And that's what really excited me about bringing you on the podcast was to talk about that program. 
workplaces have a massive opportunity right now to connect their people to purpose. You know, I think one of the things people really struggled with through the global pandemic was you took me away from my daily workplace. You took me away from the relationships. And now I feel a little, frankly, a little lost or a little loss of meaning because I don't have those engagements every day. And so I think a lot of people struggle to find out what is my purpose if it isn't about going to the office every day and being part of a team and growing a business and all those things we used to focus on. And I think as we go back to the workplace, which I think is the reality for most of us in some way, shape or form, the opportunity for businesses right now to help people get connected to uh, those opportunities to volunteer. And I don't mean make donations, donations are wonderful. I mean, hands on as you were doing at the food bank or at a habitat build or going to a senior's homes, all the different ways or cleaning up a local park. All these things really help people get packed to connecting with what's really important. And the things as Dr. Lori Santos would say from Yale, the things that actually do make us happy in the long run, not the things that we think will make us happy uh, in the short run. You know, Pete, one of the favorite parts of my job as a people manager has always been being that cheerleader and bringing the team together and showing recognition. And it usually happens at the end of the day for me, but every night before the team gets ready to go home, either they're coming by my office or I'm walking by their desk and I always would say, great job, everybody. And I'd point out what each person did that day to make the office or the workplace or life for our customers better. And I got to be honest with you, it always made me feel really great inside. Oh, Jeff, the daily interactions with your people and acknowledging the work that they do and recognizing them for the contribution that they make, that is that is gold, my friend. You know, unfortunately, I might even suggest that some people have uh, uh, put even a, a damper on that. It's like, oh, Jeff's just that happy guy. No, no, no. What Jeff is doing is actually core to the success of our organization. It's no different than I think, you know, to our, you know, a bit of a smirk when we talked about the social committee, the number of times we've blown off the social committee. I even had a boss in the beverage alcohol industry who said, Pete, look, if you're going to move your way up in this organization, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be involved with the social committee. That's really something you should leave to the, to the newbies, to the, to the lower level people. And, and now in hindsight, and at the time, I think I almost believed them. Um, I didn't stop because that just wasn't who I was. But at the end of the time, at the end of the conversation, I actually thought he was right. And now hindsight 2020, you know, we frankly need everybody to be on the social committee. We need everybody to understand how important those little interactions that we have throughout the course of the day are to our own happiness, to the happiness of the person that you say it to. So every one of those people, Jeff, was valued by the comments that you made as they were leaving the organization. And for every leader who's going to listen to this podcast to recognize that this is what drives a big part of the success of your business, because when you have a connected workplace, you have people that are happy and healthy and who want to be there. It's funny because when I first started, usually a lot of the time when I start a new role at a new organization, people think that it's a bit of an act, that I'm not really sincere. When I come in the morning, I'm like, good morning. And I say that to everybody. And they're like, really? Who is this guy? And at the end of the day, I, like I said, I say, you know what? Great job today, everybody. This is what you did. And at first, people think, nah, it's an act. And he's not really sincere. And after about two weeks, uh, people come to me and they'll say, you know what? I, I thought that, you know, that, that was an act, but it's not. You're really like this every morning and all day. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is what I'm like all day. I get really tired by the end of the day, but this is me. You know what I love about that, Jeff? And, and, and I want to be very conscious here in this conversation. So I think that type of attitude, you know, whether it's a, a personal conviction to say, I'm going to wake up on the right side of the bed every day, that's the first step in actually having the positive attitude that can get us through the challenges that we face in our, in our day-to-day lives. But I think we need to also recognize that maybe, Jeff, you are an extrovert, whereas some other people might be introverts. And even as we build our social health calendars and we work within the framework within workplaces, it's understanding that not everybody is an extrovert. 
And it's understanding that within the array of different activities we have throughout the course of the year, that some things are a simple coffee chat where it's actually a couple people getting together or a small group of people getting together. You know, we've got cultural differences. We've got demographic differences. We've got, you know, family makeup differences. We've got international people who don't have families and other people around. And this is the type of consciousness that we bring to organizations to make sure that nobody feels like they are not part of the team. And with that being one of the three biggest reasons that people have been leaving organizations as part of the great resignation, it's time for every leader to recognize it's not just about Thirsty Thursdays. It's actually about the meaningful connections. It's about the casual connections. It's about the, you know, the celebrations of people's birthday. And again, things that we might have dismissed in the past, but every one of these things combines to make, um, to make a workplace feel more connected, more inclusive, and a place where people want to work. So, Pete, if you have remote employees and you need to take care to prevent them from feeling isolated from the team at HQ, how can HR professionals improve the social health of those employees working remotely? Well, certainly within in the context of our social health calendar, the reality is we can certainly make things available to people digitally. Um, but, you know, one of my big beliefs is, you know, as we've talked about earlier in this conversation, you know, everybody needs human connection. And so there may be some people that are working, if you're working permanently in a remote circumstance, then what I think we need to do is educate those people on the importance of building healthy connection habits outside of the workplace as well as inside the workplace. Because again, this is all about balance, because even for the unfortunate ones who may lose a job, if all of your focus is only on the relationships inside your workplace, and then you lose that job, that's not going to create a happy human being either. And this is where organizations really can play a critical role in educating people about social health, educating people about human connection and the power of it, whether it's with family, friends, neighbors, colleagues, classmates, if it's a kid. And this is also about educating your team, but maybe they've got parents or kids. And this is really about creating this global movement that we're trying to create, or certainly within Canada, because the more we can put this information into people's hand, we are starting 50 years too late with this information, but we need to catch up on this information right now. And we're gonna build this national movement, one classroom and one office at a time. And every opportunity we have to have these conversations with workplaces and with the employees within them, that gives us the opportunity to spread this message across this country. So Pete, is there anything impactful that you wanted to share that we haven't talked about today? We've talked a lot about burnout over the course of the last couple of years. We did a study last year called the Canadian Social Connection Survey. And what came out of that is that the two leading indicators of burnout have nothing to do with the workplace. They're actually sleep and social connection. So when we think about the things that we need to be focusing on in the workplace, I think it's really important for us to recognize, again, that uh, we're almost becoming coaches from a proactive uh, engagement with our employees and saying, look, I don't want to have to pick up the pieces off the cafeteria floor or when some crisis hits. What I want to do is build a relationship with you that says, I care about you. And if we know that those are the leading indicators of burnout, then I think it's important that we as an organization try to grow you know, that engagement and that knowledge and all these things. So my message to every HR leader and to every business leader who's listening to this podcast is let's get serious about the importance of human connection because your life might depend on it. And frankly, the lives of the people in your workplace might depend on it. And with a few small uh, efforts to ed engage and educate your employees as a starting point and then building a proactive calendar of activities, I think we can make the world uh, and your workplace is a happier and healthier place, one face-to-face -face connection at a time. Pete, how can people connect with you? Well, hey, they can certainly connect with me at pete at genwellproject.org, but they can also go and check out our website. We're working to build a website that becomes the one-stop hub for all information about isolation, loneliness, and disconnection. Tells a little bit more about the work we do in the workplace, but most importantly, gives everybody the tools and information that can allow you to be more successful in building social connection habits in your life. Whether that's in the workplace, whether that's with your neighbor, with your friend, 
you know, our goal is to make the world a happier and healthier place. But if we have to do it one workplace at a time, we're ready to step up and be a part of that solution. Awesome. So Pete, we wrap the podcast up every podcast with a list of our guests, favorites or firsts. Ready for it? Yeah, let's go. Pete, what's the first car you owned? The first car that I owned was a Ford Taurus. What's the first job you had? First job I had was as the um, popcorn boy at the Highland Movie Theater at St. Clair and Young in, in what is now downtown Toronto or midtown Toronto. And I did that for a long time and enjoyed uh, the fruits of watching every movie for about three or four years. Now, you're responsible for just the popcorn or popcorn and beverages? I got to tell you, Jeff, initially, I was just the popcorn guy and, and serving popcorn, you know, serving the people working the cash. But I will say I worked my way up to the entire cash bar or the the the. Uh, the the food bar then i worked my way to usher and then up to cashier so i had quite the career in the entertainment business is how i like to phrase it (laughs) pete what's the first concert that you attended oh my god this is gonna make me sound like i'm a bit of a uh well i saw simon and garfunkel live at the cne um I, i think it was during the cne And I'm a huge uh, folky type uh, uh, ballad type uh, fan. And uh, and I got to say, I loved every minute of it. And what is your favorite piece of advice that you'd give to a young professional just starting out? It's all going to be okay. Well, what a great way to wrap up today's podcast. I have taken so many notes. I'm just so pleased that you and I could connect today. Thanks so much for coming on the Insights at Work podcast. Hey, Jeff, great to be here. Great conversation. And I look forward to staying in touch because, you know, as we say, stay connected. It's important for us. And with that, it looks like we've run out of racetrack. Thanks so much for listening to the episode. If you've enjoyed it, please share it with your friends and colleagues so they can benefit from it as well. If you find the Insights at Work podcast worthy, please go on to iTunes and give us a cool rating with a nice review. We certainly appreciate it. And if there's something that you would like me to discuss around this big world of HR and all things business, give me a shout. You know how to reach me on social media or through LinkedIn. In the meantime, stay healthy and be kind. We'll see you soon on the next episode of the Insights at Work podcast.